Smisha Rob Dunbar, um, Sana Canada, Hamisha Vohus, Sana Toronto, get Sana Kipanich in the hand, Yolo Hakan. Am I full of an analopinist? I guess I'm in Am Olive, a old Hagunation, and in Kachish, get Chef at Luke, a Hunam Sukutyok. I guess I'm a copies at Policy Canon, I guess Kutyok as a Logan and Canonoch. Anna Bericht and I guess at Fillendale. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good afternoon, Professor Dunbar. So very, very good to be here, uh, and thank you very much for having uh, having invited me here, Michel. Well, it's great to have you here. Uh, if we start off, if I would ask you just in general terms to explain the linguistic landscape of Scotland. Scotland's uh, all, uh, historically been a very linguistically mixed country. Um, uh, 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 earliest records um, and some of the earliest manuscripts uh, indicate uh, a great linguistic diversity that's also evident in the place names from uh, Celtic languages spoken by the early peoples, the, uh, the Picts and the Brythonic peoples, the ancestors of the uh, Welsh, uh, to uh, the Scottish Gaelic, another Celtic tongue. Norse influences because of uh, the Viking settlement, um, Norman French influences through uh, coming up from uh, uh, the south um, after the Norman conquest, Latin and so forth. Uh, but since the 17th century, uh, English has become increasingly dominant and has squeezed the other languages that are spoken in Scotland. In 1603, the uh, Scottish and the English crowns were merged. Um, and uh, thereafter, the, the new kings of England and Scotland uh, increasingly privileged uh, English language. In the 19th century, with the introduction of state-funded uh, 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 public education in 1872, all instruction was through the medium of English. So the other indigenous languages of Scotland that are still spoken, Scottish Gaelic, Celtic language, and Scots, a language closely related to English but distinct, uh, we're under increasing pressure, marginalized, not used in any public situation, did not benefit really from any uh, language legislation or other protection or policy. Um, so not surprisingly, the numbers have gone down. Can, uh, at present, there are, uh, based on the 2011 census, uh, about 57,000 Gaelic speakers. Um, 100 years ago, there were a quarter of a million, so there's a, been a very significant decrease. Uh, but the census figures show that the numbers are leveling out, um, and given that there has been some legislation and interventions in other policy areas over the last quarter of a century, uh, perhaps things are slowing down. Interestingly, for the first time, a question was asked on the census about Scots, mm -hmm. and about a million and a half What is people, the difference between Scot and Gaelic? Scots is a, a, a Germanic language, quite similar to English. Um, when you hear it spoken, when I first arrived in Scotland, you'd hear people speaking it in Glasgow, in the Northeast, um, and you'd really have to listen very carefully because uh, it's not really uh, for somebody from North America, such as myself, immediately uh, uh, comprehensible. Um, even for many Eng people from England, they have a tough time uh, working out what, what somebody is saying. But it's quite closely related to uh, English, whereas the language which I spoke in at the beginning is Gaelic, a Celtic language, very distinct. So they're, they're two. Is the Scottish Gaelic the same as the Irish Gaelic? It's similar. It's um, uh, not completely mutually intelligible, um, but with um, some basic minimal instruction, people can can, can um, understand each other, and there, there are very considerable similarities. I'd say that it would be something comparable to perhaps Portuguese and uh, Spanish, um, that, that sort of relationship. Uh, perhaps a little more distance, but, but, but quite close. Is Gaelic the, what we would identify as the Scotland's uh, uh, native language, or would it be Scots? That's that's a, a good question, and it's it's a, a somewhat controversial question. Um, certainly, from the historical record, it's of the languages that are still alive and spoken in Scotland. It can claim to be have the longest history. The language was it's thought originally brought from from Ireland in the fourth and fifth century uh, by by migrants. Although there is a theory that. That perhaps had existed independently in Scotland before then, um, whereas Scots was introduced by the Anglo uh, Angles um, mostly in the fifth to sixth century, 
Um, in the Middle Ages, the, the name Scotland, Scotland uh, refers to the land of the Scots. The uh, Scot comes from the Latin term for the Irish. So uh, literally the, 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 the Romans, late Romans were claiming that Scotland was the land of, of the, the, the Irish, um, the, the Gallic speakers. Um, the Scottish uh, throne that was unified in about the 8th century, um, the, both the historical record and the quasi-mythological record of the origins of the Scottish throne um, are that it emerged from the Gallic Scotland. Um, and by about the 11th century, Scot uh, Scots Gallic was thought to be the language of the court of the kings. Uh, it was then displaced uh, by um, court French and, and in English or Scots uh, subsequently. So many people would say that, um, yes, this is the true national language, but of course Scots is a very living language. There's been a historical divide between the highlands and the lowlands in Scotland. Uh, it was just historically a linguistic... So the islands would be Gaelic? Gaelic speaking and the lowlands uh, Scots speaking or English speaking later. Um, and from the really the high Middle Ages, there was a Oh, an awareness in Scotland of this linguistic divide. Um, uh, the earliest Scots writers uh, looked upon the people of the Highlands as being wild, barbarous, um, passionate, uh, comely appearance, whereas the people of the Lowlands were domesticated, agricultural types who liked a, a greater sense of order. But the early writers recognized that the the Gaels, the Gaelic speakers, were the true Scots um, in some sense. Uh, subsequently, um, these stereotypes uh, uh, were bound up with marginalization uh, uh, of, of the Gaelic language, and they, they persist to a certain degree. So you still have many people, proud Scots speakers, saying, well, yeah, we recognize that Sky Gaelic is a language of Scotland, but not the only or the official or the sole language of Scotland. Uh, so it's still, a, it's a very com complex uh, identity. Uh, if, if we look at Scotland today, uh, where would we find, or even in historically, where would we find the Gaelic speakers and then the, the Scots? Um, historically, we're pretty sure that Gaelic made, uh, was spoken throughout most parts of Scotland, from, mainly from place name evidence, um, except from the extreme southeast, south of Edinburgh, where there's very few identifiably Gallic uh, place names, but uh, we have a fair degree of sense of the historic linguistic border in perhaps the 11th, 12th century. Um, but uh, from the Middle Ages, certainly the 14th, 15th century, Gallic was mostly associated with the geographical highlands, the, the, the hill mountainous part of Scotland to the north of that central area comprised by Edinburgh and, and Glasgow. Um, and from the 18th century, even in the Highlands, the language has uh, slowly retreated to the northwest. So today, the only parts of Scotland that are reasonably strongly Gaelic speaking, where a majority of the population still speaks Gaelic, are restricted to the Outer Hebrides, the Western Isles, although Gaelic is still fairly widely spoken in many parts of the Inner Hebrides, um, as well as on the west coast of the Highlands. And there and are many speakers... on the speakers, mainland there? There are many speakers in, uh, uh, based on the census data of the 57,000 speakers, almost half now so live... So 57,000 speakers of Speakers Gaelic today. Right um, that's right. There's a larger... Of a population of... of 5.1 million, so a little over 1%, um, a quite a small number now. Uh, but about half of those 57,000 now live um, outside of that sort of heartland, the, the phys physical highlands and islands. They live in Glasgow, Edinburgh, um, Aberdeen, uh, and many other parts. Uh, one of the biggest concentrations of Gaelic speakers is in Glasgow, about 10,000 Gaelic speakers are in the greater Gal uh, uh, Glasgow area. And um, also, uh, since the 1980s, Gaelic medium education has been created. It's now possible um, to uh, have in some places all of your primary education and some subjects in secondary through the medium of Gaelic and it's taken off in, in and urban those centers. are public funded? Uh, public schools? funded, yes, yes. Um, uh, there are only uh, two, uh, three standalone schools now, uh, one in Inverness, uh, but one in Glasgow and one in Edinburgh. I stand alone school. Uh, they, uh, it's only Gaelic speaking. Only Gaelic speaking. Uh, yeah, uh, there are about 59 other schools, primary schools, uh, mostly in the Highlands and the Islands, but also in other parts of Scotland, 
where there are Gallic medium classes in English-speaking schools. Um, They're taught so, as a, it's taught as a second language. Uh, the, for many. Um, uh, some of the children going into Gallic medium education, we don't have precise statistics about, but it's been estimated based on a sort of gut feeling that many researchers such as myself have that uh, probably across the country, perhaps 20 to 25 percent of children in Gallic medium education have the language at the home, uh, but the great majority are children who uh, do not come from Gallic-speaking homes. Um, and certainly in the urban centres, we have a five-year-old who just started in primary school at the Ed new Edinburgh Gallic Medium School, a, stand, uh, a separate school, run, everything takes place through the medium of Gallic. Um, uh, he and a couple of other classmates have Gallic at home, but the large majority are people who um, may have some relationship with the language, perhaps a parent or a grandparent, uh, but themselves are not Gaelic speakers. So um, the phenomenon is similar to what's happened in Ireland and to, to some extent in Wales as well. It's familiar from Canada as well. Um, in some respects, it's similar to French medium education for Anglophones, immersion. Uh, French immersion education. Um, uh, and people are convinced of the educational benefits that come with it, uh, culturally enriched education. Um, and so forth. So, from that sense, there's. Um, is that helping revive it? It is helping, with, without question. I think it's helped to make the uh, Gallic medium education a very popular option. You do see uh, a lot of increasing middle class parents at the school. I'm at Edinburgh University and at uh, the Gallic school. There is it are, mainly a middle class? Uh, not, ma not mainly, but significantly, I'd say, um, in, in the cities at least. In, in the Hebrides, the heartlands, um, it's, it's more mixed. Um, ironically, um, that's where the, 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 the take-up of Gallic medium education has not been as strong. Many Gallic-speaking parents in the Hebrides still have very old-fashioned linguistic ideologies that uh, uh, children won't get ahead unless they can speak English uh, very well. If they're educated through the medium of Gaelic, they will function less well in English. And all of the research tends to show that the children, their linguistic capacity increases. In fact, one of the, the research that's been done in Scotland on children in Gaelic medium education shows that virtually all subject areas, the educational outcome amongst children of similar socioeconomic backgrounds, keeping you know other factors similar, are quite similar, but in, in certain areas, the performance in, 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 of the Gallic medium children is better. Mm -hmm. One area is in, in English, um, and fluency and outcomes in English, even though English is introduced fairly late after about the, in the fourth year of primary education. Um, so convincing parents that um, having their children educated through their uh, native language is not a cause of uh, the, 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 something that limits them, but it may be a good thing, is, is one of the challenges um, in, in the heartland areas. Interesting. What, what about Scots? Do the Scott language, does it also have the schooling? Or? None whatsoever. Is it a um, written language? Or? It is a written language, um, but there, it's never been standardized, and there are many different dialects. Um, in the northeast of Scotland, in Aberdeenshire and Murrayshire in the northeast of the country, um, where the long, uh, language based on the census results seems to be strongest. They have a very distinct uh, northeast dialect, um, which is quite different from the sort of Scots you may hear in southwest Scotland. Uh, many different uh, phrases, some different differences in pronunciation. Um, it's certainly written. Uh, Robert Burns, uh, the national poet, composed not all, but a significant amount of his poetry in, in Scots. Um, uh, the New Testament was translated in the 20th century into Scots um, by uh, a, a Scots language enthusiast, um, but it was a sort of synthetic form. He took um, um, a different, uh, 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 different dialects and synthesized them. There is a, a strong record of, of written Scots um, from the late Middle Ages um, and into the 17th century. Um, significant late, middle um, late middle medieval poets who, who wrote in Scots and who are well known. Um, and also it was used as an official language in the court system, in the legal system, 
uh, in what years? It, uh, up until the 17th century, and the seven, after the Union of the Crowns in 1603, English were the laws written. In Scots? Laws were written in Scots. Um, the Scots law tradition is a, is a, a, a hybrid of common law and civilian forms. It's a mixed jurisdiction, much. Uh, the same way that uh, Louisiana, uh, Israel, um, Quebec uh, are, are mixed jurisdictions. Um, and uh, one of the important sources of Scots law uh, are um, these works of synthesis that early uh, scholars um, uh, did. Many of them wrote in Scots. Um, and so uh, in terms of legal um, uh, uh, documents, legal treaties, and so forth, and decisions as well as laws themselves, we do have. But it's uh, not taught in, in the but school it, system. But it's not taught. Um, there's no sort of, uh, and of course that medieval Scots would be different from any of the dialects yes. that you'd hear today. Um, so one of the struggles in terms of Scots language policy, it's a current debate, uh, to what extent should the language be synthesized? Um, uh, a common standard, a written standard, and arguably a, a spoken standard develop, uh, but there are great sensitivities because the the, the local variants are, are, are quite distinct um, and people have a great loyalty to it. People are exposed to Scots because um, uh, many traditional folk songs are in Scots. Uh, there's a great ballad tradition associated with both the borders and the northeast. Um, and uh, school children will learn songs in Scots. Um, everybody does a bit of Burns um, for Burns Day at the end of February. The students are, uh, whether they spoke Scots or not, they would have to lear learn Tam o' Shanter, um, uh, written in good, good Scots. So, so people have a, 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 a they do um, interact with Scots. One of the criticisms that is made of the BBC um, in Scotland is that not enough of their programming is programming which reflects the common speech which is heard around them. It tends to be standard English, spoken all, all, almost always with a Scottish accent, but they could do much more programming that's based on the common speech of, of um, the common people where the language is strongest. So, so basically, if we look at the language um, issues, that there's Scots and Gaelic. Gaelic as a certain form of protection in the education system, so there must yes. be an education act that uh, provides for that? Yes. Um, in, as I mentioned earlier, in 1872, uh, the state-funded education was introduced and no provision was made for education through anything other than English. But in 18, eight, or 1918, an amendment was included in the Education Scotland Act, uh, which required the local education authorities, the branches of local government that oversee uh, public education, to provide uh, for the teaching of Gaelic in Gaelic-speaking areas. Um, there's never any court cases to uh, interpret these two vague terms. What is the teaching of Gaelic? Could that mean a few minutes a day? Or does that mean education through the medium of Gaelic? Nor did, was the term Gaelic-speaking area ever defined. Uh, most people in 1918 probably had in mind the Highlands and the Hebrides, but there were very large numbers of Gaelic speakers in Glasgow at that time, and there always have been. Uh, one would, would, would have been nice to see a court So how do you decide this. where Gaelic should be taught? Um, it was left to the education authorities themselves. Um, and in the early days after uh, 1918, um, the, the classes in Gaelic were introduced, um, primarily at the secondary level, and almost exclusively in the Highlands and the Hebrides. So um, the, the, you'd have uh, perhaps 40 minutes a day um, of grammar, um, um, some Gallic poetry, some Gallic prose. Uh, overwhelmingly in those days, the students would be Gallic, native Gallic speakers. Um, but from what we can tell, quite frequently they were taught by other Gallic speaking mm. speak, uh, teachers through the medium of English. Um, so there was some statutory basis um, which um, uh, required local authorities to respond. They responded whether they could have done so more creatively and, and with a much more um, Gallic ethos, uh, where Gallic would be the language of instruction in schools, uh, is something we'll never know because nothing, no litigation was ever initiated to test 
what the, the vague requirement meant. Um, in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, uh, a preschool movement was started, modeled on the Welsh preschool movement and on the Maori preschool movement in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Um, uh, parents were inspired um, uh, to create um, voluntary preschool groups f um, which provided um, all care through the medium of Gaelic for both Gaelic and non-Gaelic speaking children. Uh, um, and again, the urban centers, particularly Glasgow uh, and Inverness were important. Um, and this led to some demand for Gaelic medium education rather than simply the teaching of Gaelic as a subject. Um, Gaelic medium education started in 1985. It had no statutory basis, really. Um, it was left to local councils to respond to demand. Um, the biggest legal intervention was in 1986 when uh, the British government uh, created through a statutory order, uh, statutory instrument, um, a, a scheme of uh, grants um, for every pound that would be invested by a local authority in creating a new Gallic medium class. Um, the central government would provide for a period of three years, uh, three pounds. So it was a, quite a significant investment, which still exists and that has helped to uh, encourage rather than require um, uh, local authorities to expand uh, Gallic medium education. And today, there, there, are there any provisions in the, the, the Act? Uh, there, there, there was a new provision in the year 2000. There was an Education Act. Um, uh, it was a, so, a sort of omnibus education uh, legislation brought in by the new Scottish Parliament in 1999. Uh, devolution came to Scotland, a new mm -hmm. Scottish Parliament was created. By devolution we mean that powers were transferred from Westminster That's right. to... That's right. Prior Edinburgh. to that, the UK was one of the most centralized yes. states in, in the developed world. Um, um, uh, only essentially one Parliament for all of the UK and its significant diversity in London, the Westminster Parliament. And in 1999, um, three new Parliaments were created, one in Wales, uh, one in Northern Ireland and, and one in Scotland. And in the case of both the Northern Ireland Assembly and, and the Scottish Parliament, uh, quite significant um, uh, policy powers were, were given, similar to the Canadian constitutional uh, settlement. Um, Scot the Scottish Parliament now has authority over education, local government, um, local commerce, uh, and so forth, with other powers, including over broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, monetary affairs, uh, macroeconomic development still uh, with the, the London Parliament. Uh, but because of that, the Scottish Parliament was in a position to legislate on many things that touched on its indigenous languages. So they, they, they legislated on education? On education, there was an Education Act in 2000. Now, slightly before that, the main Gaelic advocacy organization had put together a series of proposals for a language act. There had never been a language act. They were inspired especially by Wales, yes. where in 1993 the Welsh Language Act was created. Um, and they said it's time that the Gaelic language had a similar legislation here. Um, they got it eventually in 2005, but the proposals contained a number of things and they were influenced by um, Section 23 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom. Um, they included proposals uh, for the creation of a statutory right to Gaelic medium education where there was sufficient demand. And because they had less uh, confidence in um, policymakers and perhaps the courts to decide what is reasonable and sufficient demand compared to um, uh, Canadian constitution makers in, in 1981. Um, th they also proposed that statutory uh, sufficient demand be uh, interpreted as demand on behalf of five children. In so five children would be sufficient to have ex instruction? Uh, uh, in at least a Gallic medium class okay. in, 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 in a particular school. If five parents requested that their children be taught in the local school through the medium of Gaelic, uh, they would, um, um, as a sort of bottom uh, baseline uh, provision. Um, and it was thought leaving reasonable demand uh, um, as a, a, an undefined term to a certain extent, it had to mean this, but it could mean something else, would also create the basis for demanding perhaps a standalone Gaelic school if there was sufficient demand and so forth. And that's still the um, legislation which that, is in place now? That, or? however, wasn't included. The, um, when the omnibus school legislation appeared in early 2000, the Gaelic organization 
organizations campaigned for the inclusion of this right. The government at the time uh, wasn't minded to um, uh, support it. The SNP, the Scottish National Party, was in opposition and they, together with a Gaelic-speaking member of the Liberal Party, um, put forward an amendment which would have created the statutory right, uh, but it was voted down. However, the government did respond by imposing um, essentially reporting obligations on local councils that already provided um, some Gaelic education. They had to report on what they were doing and crucially how they were going to increase the amount of Gaelic that they were uh, providing as a sort of um, SOP or response to this campaign for a right. So we still don't have a right, but we have increasing amounts of small developments in education legislation which have um, been useful um, in terms of uh, equipping Gaelic activists um, and also supportive uh, local administrators and local politicians in in pushing in pushing things ahead. So if we move out a little bit of the education field, are, are there any other provisions or protections uh, for the Gaelic language or, uh, in legislation in Scotland? There are a number or of Scots? little things. Um, um, <coughs> for Scots, there is nothing in legislation yet. Uh, but in Scots law and, and UK law, there is really nothing for, for no provision at all for Scots right now. Um, and no formal policy. The Scottish National Parliament, uh, Party is supportive of Scots, but they've not developed a clear policy as to what their language policy will be with regard to Scots. Um, they've uh, supported some recent studies on the extent to which Scot is, Scotch, Scots is used, um, but, um, uh, but, but, but Scots is, is in a legal um, no man's land, we could see right now. Gaelic has benefited from a number of things, um, both indirectly and indirectly. Um, uh, minor provisions in some legislations, uh, so some legislation has um, uh, 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 essentially facilitated the use of Gaelic in new domains. Uh, in 1984, uh, regulations to the, the traffic codes uh, were created, which allowed for uh, bilingual or Gaelic-only signage, and since then, um, based on this sort of permissive legislation, it doesn't require Gaelic signage anywhere, but it permits it. And um, do you find Gaelic? Increasingly, yes. In um, the Western Isles, the Gaelic-speaking areas, most road signage is now in Gaelic only. Um, and uh, throughout most parts of the Highlands now, um, uh, most signage is, is bilingual, with Gaelic um, taking precedence. Um, uh, the signage is usually on a green field, a green background. Um, Gaelic will be come first in yellow and then English below in white, but usually in the same font. So um, um, and th this has developed over the last 10 to 15 years um, and the central governments uh, of whatever persuasion have been quite supportive of, of, of this d d development. So you have things like that. Um, a, a piece of legislation in 1997 allowed local authorities in Scotland to opt for a Gaelic only name and the local authority in the Western Isles, the Gaelic, uh, the last remaining fairly strongly Gaelic speaking area, has a Gaelic only uh, name. Um, so most legislation has been permissive. Um, in the area of broadcasting there have been significant developments. In 1990, in the Broadcasting Act, um, provision was made for the creation of a fund um, uh, which would be administered by a body created under the legislation um, uh, to essentially um, subsidize the greater production of Gaelic television programming and then after 1996 radio programming as well. Um, uh, however, there was no statutory formula as to how much um, money should be included. Uh, there and are all, does it exist today? It still exists. It's transformed um, a bit. Uh, the biggest problem was that um, uh, although greater amounts of Gaelic television w were made, and there was some minimal obligation put on private sector broadcasters in Scotland to broadcast a certain amount of this programming, including a certain amount in prime viewing times, um, however, um, the, um, uh, 
the broadcasting was still in the hands of, the, of both the BBC and the broadcasters themselves, and it was not a particularly good system. You didn't have a large number of hours of television programming, and they were also <coughs> at uh, uh, sometimes unpredictable times. There was a Gallic comedy program that showed a family, uh, an alarm clock ringing, and the family rushing to get up to race down, and it was about 3 a.m., and the family assembled in the front of the television to see the, the, the Gallic television programming for the week. So um, it, it was a system that wasn't working particularly well, and because of this, uh, the mounted a campaign Gallic activists, as well as the authority itself that was created under this legislation for a Gallic television channel. In 2003, in the Communications Act of that year, um, a new body was created uh, that assumed the funding that had uh, been created under previous legislation, um, uh, under which um, uh, essentially they were given not only the power to make, uh, but also to engage in broadcasting, should they choose. Um, and the decision was made strategically, right, we now have the statutory authority to uh, perhaps even get a broadcasting license. Um, but rather than exercising that option, uh, they entered into negotiations with the BBC in Scotland uh, to create a, a, essentially a, a partnership um, under which uh, the bulk of the funding for a Gallic television channel came from uh, the body that had been first created in 1990. Uh, with significant uh, news provision, something the BBC does well uh, through the medium of Gaelic, and an integrated service. The BBC had already created a very good and uh, generally quite widely available Gaelic radio service. So it was a good solution, and in 2008, uh, this new BBC television service called BBC Alap, the Gaelic word for Scotland, uh, went on air. And now it's freely available, six and a half hours or so of broadcasting a day. Uh, evening news on television in Gaelic. Um, and for Gaelic speakers, this has been a revolution uh, okay. to see their language on television, on television. Uh, all the time and freely available. Uh, uh, for, uh, in other change. sectors, for example, uh, uh, public service in Gaelic, is that possible to obtain public services? From the Things, that's the third area where there has been some significant legislative developments. Um, until 2005, it was really a matter for um, uh, local governments and other governmental bodies, there was no legislation and no regulation. Um, the council created in the Western Isles to serve that Gaelic-speaking heartland in 1975, they developed a Gaelic policy, but it was never particularly well implemented. Um, people, of course, Gaelic speakers themselves, the same problem that we find with linguistic minorities mm -hmm. everywhere, all bilingual, um, used to dealing with the, the, the local authority English. through the medium of English because of the absence of any Gaelic, significant Gaelic education except for a few classes at secondary level. Many Gaelic speakers were not literate in their own language, they didn't have a technical vocabulary. Um, um, and also to implement um, a full bilingual policy requires an infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You need you know, civil servants who have both linguistic skills and training in their particular area, whether it's planning or um, you know, public health and the, the sort of uh, human resource infrastructure that's needed for bilingualism didn't exist. So these were significant problems that really were never overcome. Um, so the uh, public authorities could create policies, but only two uh, local councils really had mm -hmm. any sort of policy at all. Mm -hmm. 2005 uh, was a change. Uh, the Gaelic Language Act was passed by the Scottish Parliament in that year. It creates no rights, um, so the Gaelic speakers still have no rights that would be recognized here um, with regard to uh, access to public services through the medium of their own language. But it was modeled, the legislation was modeled very much on the Welsh Language Act of 2003. It created a language board. The language board could require any public body um, working in Scotland, any part of Scotland, to prepare a language plan in which it would set out the ways in which it would um, both provide services to the public, uh, but also provide for the use of the language in their internal operations. Um, and uh, the legislation also allowed the language board to create statutory guidance 
that had to be considered um, by the pub, uh, any public authority that was requested to pre prepare a plan. And they set out in their guidance that there had to be provisions on things like signage, on service provision through the medium of Gaelic, on um, staffing um, and so forth. Uh, so it set a framework. And since then, public authorities have uh, been, been required and have prepared these language plans, setting out what their commitments will be. Um, it's really too early to say uh, mm -hmm. how, how well it's been implemented. I've done some research on this and we're working on developing a bigger research project to focus on both in implementation but also the extent to which both behaviors of the organizations and behaviors of the public they serve have, um, ha have changed. Uh, based on the research that I and others have done so far, um, I think there's a relatively low level of awareness both within organizations and in the public. Um, and um, some things haven't changed very dramatically. But in terms of the visibility of the language and signage, uh, things like that, it has made a difference. You now will see the language, uh, what 20 or 30 years ago was um, a hidden language in many senses now has a public visibility and presence. But in terms of service provision, it's still, I would say, very poor. Just a last question. Uh, how positive are you about the future of the Gaelic language in Scotland? I am um, uh, um, concerned about the language um, because the uh, heartland areas where the language is, has historically been the language of day-to-day -day communications, in those areas, the language is weakening uh, very significantly, um, to the point where Gaelic as a community language, a uh, language of informal communication amongst the majority of the population, is uh, in danger of disappearing. Uh, at the same time, though, there's greater numbers of people learning the language. There's um, increasing political support, the sort of marginalization and the sort of negative stereotyping of Gaelic and its speakers. And many of these stereotypes will be familiar to other linguistic mm -hmm. minorities, that it's a language of the past, that it's a language associated with rural people, with farmers and fishermen and poverty, uh, all of these stereotypes. Uh, much of those stereotypes have changed remarkably in the last 20 or 30 years. There's goodwill at the political level. There is international treaty provisions which people are aware of. Um, and there are more people, including middle class people, opting to have their children educated. It's a mark of pride for, for people. Uh, you see new literary expressions. You have it on television. You're now possible to, small number of jobs, but increasing number of jobs where people need the language and use the language in the workplace. So I'd say that um, nothing is inevitable um, with any linguistic minority, even marginalized ones. Um, uh, but I think the main challenge is now is to increase the social use of the language where possible and to come up with some strategy to protect the language where it is still um, a, a, a can claim to be a community language. So I guess I leave on a sort of mixed note. Uh, I'm optimistic. I think it will continue to be spoken and used, uh, but at a community level, um, I, I'm, I'm more worried about the, the prospects for the language. Well, thank you very much, Professor Thunbar, for that resume or the overview of the linguistic situation in Scotland. And certainly, we'll have to meet again in a couple of years to si do a follow-up on this. Yes. Thank you very much. À la prochaine fois en français, j'espère. Oui, à la prochaine fois en français, ça serait excellent. Merci. Merci.